So good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm really well. You're good? Yeah. It seems to be the perfect place to meet Elton John in 2004, is Vegas. Yeah, well this is where we came in February um, and started our kind of little residency here when Celine goes away on a holiday, we kind of fill in for her. Mm -hmm. um, and I never thought I'd end up playing in Vegas. I'd never stayed the night in Vegas before. <laughs> we fly to the MGM Grand, do the show and go home to uh, LA or go back to LA. And when it was suggested to come to Vegas, um, I thought, oh God, I mean, most people think that's the end of me, I'm going yeah. to Vegas. In the old days, this is where people came to end their careers. It's not so much now, but it's changed, it's a much younger, hipper city. Uh, but uh, there was the danger of what do I do, because yeah. the theater I'm playing in is one of the biggest stages in the world. It's 120 feet wide by 80 feet deep. That's crazy. So I knew I'd have to do a proper show and, um, and not just come here with a band, I get lost. And I didn't want to do that anyway. The whole point of coming to Vegas is to try to do something new. So I hooked up with David LaChapelle, who's done videos for me and is a friend of mine and a great photographer. Um, and I said, listen, shall we do this show together? And he's, he's a big fan of mine. And, and I knew he would do exactly the, the sort of show that I wanted to do, a nostalgic kind of hint to my past, um, a reference to my love of art and photography, um, outrageous campiness, fun. Um, and you know, I'm only on stage for an hour and a half, so you've got to get all that in within an hour and a half. And I wanted to be like a roller coaster ride. So we took a risk, we came here, uh, and it paid off, and we're having great fun. And I'm really, really enjoying being in Las Vegas. I never thought I'd be able to say that, but I really am, because um, the show is so much fun every night. Something different happens that I see. I don't really watch what's going on behind me because uh, I'm trying to play with the audience, obviously. But uh, I notice something different every night that's going on on the screen or, or, or the lights or whatever. So it's it's and it's the only show I've ever done like this. So it's fun. And how did you conceptualize it with David? Did you? I he just I said you do it. I'll be there when you've done it. Um, it's, you know I'm a collaborator. I mean I collaborate with Bernie Taupin. I don't write lyrics. I write melodies. Mm -hmm. We don't write in the same room. Uh, with David, I just said, here's the set list. The only thing we collaborated on was here's the set list because yeah. he had to do the films to coincide with the length of the songs. So, I mean, there's an 11 minute, 19 second version of Rocket Man, for example, awesome. uh, that he had to cut a film to. Um, and it has to be 11 minutes, 19 seconds. So, exactly. Yeah, so, they're, they're, you know, you have to get that right. Otherwise, it looks like amateur night out. <laughs> that, but that was the only thing we collaborated on was the set list. And the great thing about that is that you can just take songs out and put songs in. Like, we've just put a new song in from our new album. Answer in the sky, so that, and and we can do, you know, over the next three, two or three years, where we hit, we'll evolve completely. I mean, the beginning and the ending might be the same, but what's in the middle of it will probably be different, mm -hmm. um, because you know there's so many songs on the new album that visually can be terrific, like um, they call of the cat, which is about a sex change, yeah. or turn the lights up when you leave, which is a country song, which is really, and you could do a great video for. He's already done a great video for all, all that I'm allowed, which will be coming in the show very soon. So you know, it's it it was the ideal marriage, and and it's worked. Is it rewarding for you night after night to see the people because? There, there have been some instances in your career where you said, you know, I didn't feel the audience. I don't feel them even though they're there. Even though I'm playing in front of 50,000 people, I don't feel them. Do you finally feel I it? Do, I do. I've, I've been much more comfortable in the last few years with, with that kind of situation because I'm comfortable with my life off stage as well as on stage. But I, it, it's such a great intimate theater. It holds about f just over 4,000 people, but it feels like 2,000. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you look at people's faces during the show and they're just... I don't know whether to watch you or to watch what's going on, and some of the internet now with their mouths open. Um, and I know that they go out, and I, you know, because I, you know, I check what they're saying when I go out to the lobby and stuff like that. Have people listening to what they're saying, and they've never seen anything like it before. And, and that's what we wanted to achieve when we came in a show in Vegas that no one had seen anything like that before. Yeah, but, I mean, the Rolling Stones have used blow. -up. We use a lot of blow ups on stage, but the Rolling Stones use them in stadiums when people were miles away. People are being, you know, practically hit on the head by. <laughs> bananas and stuff like that. Um, so, um, yeah, it is great to see the reaction that you get. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know why it happened, but on the opening night, um, during Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting, which is the last number in the, in the set, before I come back on stage, people just started to come on stage and dance. And it was like, I was petrified. I thought they were coming for me. And I thought, well, oh my God, they're coming for me. And they just started to come. And it's become a tradition. People just, in the first three rows, they just get up there and they dance and they kick the balloons out and they just have a great time so it's like the audience part of the audience on stage with me for the last song Whoa. and that was just completely off the wall I don't know why it happened but anyway it's uh, it's it's fun it's just an uplifting show for me it's not too long it's an hour and a half which is usually 
an hour, at least an hour shorter than I do normally. Yeah. And so it's, um, I can kind of catch up with myself here. I can pause, get a, you know, get my breath back, and then restock my batteries for when I go back out there again. Mm -hmm. And it, visually, and looking at the set list as well, and even on this new album, as you said, there's a return, there's a looking back, there's kind of a reflection on the past and bringing it back into the new. Yeah. And that's kind of been going on since Songs from the West Coast. Yeah. What triggered that need or that wanting to go back? Was it you changing the lifestyle you led? Was it you saying, I need to go back to that period? Was it someone that encouraged no, you? No, I think really uh, the, the person who should take credit for that is Patrick Leonard, who produced Songs from the West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I look back and analyze my albums you know, since I've been sober, one of my main criticisms of what I did on those albums is that I was trying to be someone else. I mean, I'm a huge yeah. music fan, so it's very tempting to say, well, I'd love to do something like Groove Armada or Prodigy or do a hit, try a hip-hop thing or a reggae thing. Or, and because I'm like a sponge, I listen to so much music. So I was trying to be something other than Elton John, and Patrick said, um, you know, just play a lot of piano, which you haven't been doing. Um, mm. Go back to just playing piano on every track. Um, write simply, play with a smaller rhythm section. Don't have so many you know, synth overdubs. Um, and that's what we did with Songs of the West Coast, that, and, and, it, and it worked, and I enjoyed it. And this album is a natural progression from that album, where I went to Atlanta with my band and pl made a record that we, is pretty organic, and we played together like we did on the Honky Chateau album or the yeah. Yellow Big Road album. And, um, and it was returned to doing, being honest to my, true to myself, doing what I do best, playing lots of piano, writing songs and just singing them the best and putting the best arrangement on them that I could without doing too, you know, without overproducing it. Did you ever feel like you were competing with that past, that 1971 to 1976 yeah, type of... I mean, it's such an incredible um, amount of material and, and such a high standard of material. You know, I, I've been, in explaining that in interviews that I've been doing, an artist, we had so much momentum then, we had so much innocence, we weren't thinking about what we were doing, we were just having so much fun being successful, meeting people, traveling the world, and we just we had we were having to do two albums a year in our record contract. We did seventeen albums in five years, yeah. uh, different B sides, different singles. It wasn't difficult, um, and that was how the record business industry was in those days. I wish it was like that now. Um, and you have that momentum, and then you stop, and you think, well, I've got to get a house now. I've got to do something. I've got to, you know, I've got to have a private life. And when you lose that momentum, it's never the same again. And, and, and every artist has that kind of like four or five year spurt when they can do no wrong because they, they're just working on autopilot and everything's great. And then, you know, you have to balance your life out between your private life or try and balance it between your private life and your career. I was sensible enough to know that I, my records weren't going to come in at number one all the time, that it would end because you know, I've been you know, studying music and the, the record business for so long, I knew it back to front. But what we've achieved with the last two albums is at least, I think, a return to form, a return to consistency, um, and not, you know, it, it, the, the basic songs are there. Uh, and I think, you know, you, you're never going to be re able to repeat those five or six years that we had because it was just glorious. Um, but you can certainly um, go back and try and think what you did in those days. And what we did was write songs, record them with a band, um, you know, there was, and it was easy, they were simple. Write them, record them together, yeah. Put them down on tape. Easy. <laughs> and we lost our technology. Can make you lose your way sometimes, and you get have to get back to the simplicity, and and the idea of playing together. And I think that's helped us in the last two albums. Yeah, you were saying something that I was reflecting on. Seventeen albums in five years. You know, writing crazy legendary songs yeah. over breakfast. Right. Writing whole albums in two days. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memories of that period? The, the creative part of that period? Or is it just all one crazy workaholic it's, blur? It's one crazy workaholic blur, um, but fun. I mean, I have no negative in anything. It was just, you know, we had to do albums. We had budgets. We had a budget to do an album. Even when we got to the Yellow Brick Road stage, we had a budget. It was a double album. We'd already been to Jamaica to try and call, uh, record it, so we lost some of our budget. So we had to record it quickly, to you know, so we didn't go over budget. Um, and you know they were good restrictions to have because you know it's like the white stripes made um, elephant in one yeah. day, I think. Yeah. And it's brilliant, <laughs> it's <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Uh, and, and I think the more time you spend on stuff, the more you lose your way, and the more time you try and remix stuff, the more you lose your way. And uh, I'm always been a, a quick writer and a quick recorder, um, and that's what I've been on the last two albums. I mean, 
I, I've gone back to doing vocals live instead of comping them. Like, you know, that drove me crazy doing five vocals and then a producer putting them together. I can sing. I, know, I just If I've made a mistake, I'll just drop in and, and do it live. Mm-hmm. So um, we've kind of got all those kind of things out of the way, all the unnecessary. We're playing to my strengths um, rather than to my weaknesses. And, um, you know, I'm, I can do, I'm a good musician. I can play something. I can put down a take you know, with a band in two or three takes. We can get it done. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's amazing. It sounds good. Is there a parallel to be made bef- between the first song on your album, between the first lyrics of Way to the World yeah. and what you're feeling now? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an incredibly uh, intuitive lyric by Mr. Torpin. Um, and I wanted the album to start with that song because, you know, it's how I'm feeling. And it's, you know, I, I'm so glad to be uh, see a sunset instead of a line of coke. Um, I'm amazed that I'm still around considering what I put myself through in the past. Um, uh, and I, I'm having more fun now than I've ever done. I mean, apart from those first five or six years, this is the most fun I've had since then because uh, I have so many options in my life. I have a great personal life, which you know I didn't have in those days. Um, mm. I didn't have time for a personal life. We were always on the road. But after that, you know, I, I tried to have a personal life, and it was difficult. You know, I didn't know how to balance my life on stage and off stage. I have that now because I've got a partner who can help me through that. I don't have the the the, the, um, the hindrance of drug and alcohol, which was you know, you know, not good for me. Um, and you know, I have I not only make records. If I was just making records and touring, it would be boring. But something that The Lion King did for me was open a, a complete myriad of options. Um, I, I could write film scores, write musicals for the stage, write you know, yeah. songs for movies, um, do classical concerts, play. Um, solo tours, tour with the band, tour with Billy Joel, do yeah. Vegas, um, we're producing a film, an animation film for Disney, um, I'm chairman of the Old Vic Theatre, I have my AIDS charity, I'm still president of my football club. My life is full of different things all the time, and people say, how do you fit it all in? Well, I, I know, I work pretty quickly, and I create pretty quickly, so it's not as if I'm slaving away for nine months on an album, I'm not, the album's done in three or four weeks, and then it was mixed in like two weeks, so easy, six weeks, album, thank you, next. <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe at a certain period in your life, all those things that you just named, um, people would have seen it as filling a void. Yeah. But it doesn't seem that way now. It seems like you can actually, each thing has its own place. Were those filling a void at one point though? No, I didn't have any, I mean, the void that I felt was with the drugs and alcohol. Um, these are just nice, um, you know, I'm 56 years old and, and I've got, I'm not just doing, uh, going, making albums and touring. I've got other things yeah. to to um, to challenge me. Uh-huh. I mean, at the beginning of this year, for example, we came here, which was a risk, and I produced my own album, which was a risk because I'd never produced my own album before or anyone's album before. I'd co-produced it, but not solo produced it. And there were danger signs there, which I I, I was aware of that you, you can be cut too close to it. And I said, okay, give me two weeks. If it's not working in two weeks, I'll put my hand up and say, listen, I need a producer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, it turned out brilliantly. Um, and it was a risk that I took at 56. Coming here was a risk at 56. If you've got challenges in your career and you're, and you're prepared to meet them, um, then you should be grateful to have those challenges. Yeah. And I would, I would, the antithesis of what I... Uh, this show is the antithesis in Vegas of what I would have you know, hated to do. It's like, come here and play my hits and just, you know, in a, in a lounge setting. I couldn't have... I mean, that would, that's the end. That's why I left my original band, Bluesology. Because I was playing with Long John Baldry, and we were, and, and he'd had a hit, and we were playing cabaret to people who weren't interested in what we were playing and eating fish and chips. And I thought, this is no life for a musician who wants to, you know, yeah. to to do other things. And so, you have to challenge yourself. And I've been lucky enough for the Lion King. To, that was the, the one thing in my life that cha- opened so many doors that I could do different things. And I love writing for the stage, and I love writing for films. And you know, it's different as a musician. You want to stretch yourself. Sometimes you stretch yourself and it doesn't work, but at least you've tried it. Absolutely. I find it interesting that you mention, you know, bluesology and the kind of kick in the butt it gave you, and the fact that you still carried whatever history you had with them through your name, yeah. through Elton John, yeah. through the fact that for such a long time in the beginning, you know, you weren't even thinking of singing Bernie's yeah. songs, even after a solo record. It's interesting that you've still carried that with you. Is it a reminder of that period? No, it's just, they, they were great days. I mean, yeah. a kid leaves school, um, I go and work in the music publishers, uh, but I still have my semi-pro band with Bluesology. We get, we turn professional backing people like Patti LaBelle and Billy Stewart, Major Lance, Lee Dorsey. Um, 
we learn, we're driving up and down and getting paid nothing, but just having the chance to play music and being in a band and playing live was the greatest feeling in the world. We were, you know, and the music that we were playing before that was um, a big influence. I mean, we were playing blues, we were playing Jimmy Witherspoon music. We were playing, we were seeking out great music that other people weren't playing because there were so many bands better than us that were playing James Brown and Wilson Pickett and Mose Allison and stuff like that. So we, we made it, uh, I made it um, definitely uh, uh, an aim to go and you know find things by Jimmy Witherspoon, J.B. Lenoir, uh, people that, and other people that people that people hadn't heard of. Um, Otis Spann was a great piano player. So we tended to uh, that's stay with me because it's. Uh, I'm always a fan of the obscure. I'm a mainstream mm. artist that loves the obscure. Yeah, and it's. I really find it admirable the way you still support new artists, like you, more than anyone else of your generation or your age. And a lot of people sometimes would wonder why. You know, why does he spend so much time promoting? Whoever, you know, yeah, Nelly yeah. Furtado, why does he sing with Eminem? Why? You know, I, I know all the music that it's in my, I've got an incredible store cupboard or computer of all the, you know, everything I've heard from a child up to um, the present day. And I'm interested in finding new things like, you know, the killers who live in mm. Las Vegas. I saw them on a TV show in Paris. We got them on like a house on fire. I really loved their record. Um, you have to, I think, help young people. So many people helped me when I was breaking in America. I got telegram from George Harrison when my album was in the charts and it meant so much to me. The band came down to see me play in Philadelphia and, and I was the biggest band fanatic in the world. Um, I played with Leon Russell on two tours, he was my idol and we were both piano players happening at the same time. He couldn't have been nicer to me. Um, Bob Dylan came to the film more recently and said, hey, I love that burn down the mission. You have no idea how much that gives you confidence and, and um, affirmation that you're doing okay and doing the right thing. Um, yeah. And you know, I never forgot that. And 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 you know, people like you know, I, I honestly believe that we're all mortal as songwriters in this world, except for Rufus Wainwright, who is you know, the, 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 is on another stratosphere. I mean, I really sincerely believe he's the greatest songwriter in the world, bar none. I mean, we are all setting his feet in, in honor, and, and it frustrates the shit out of me that he can't get played on the radio because he doesn't. You know, he's so great, doesn't fit into, you know. The, the calculated pack that they play. It's funny because I see so much of you in him. Yeah. I see so much of Elton John in people like Andre 3000. Right. The over the topness, right. the costumes, the. Yeah. But at the same time, the kind of inner isolation, but maybe. Too, yeah, and, but the music's so great. And the music too. Do you see? Do you do you recognize yourself in people yeah. like that? Yeah, absolutely. And when you meet them and you see how great they are and they're so sweet and. Uh, I met Beck at my Oscar party last year, and I'm a huge Beck fan. And um, I couldn't believe how nice he was, and how you know, just talked to him. And uh, he's one, of, you know, I'm a, as I said, I'm a mainstream artist. But unless you have the Becks and the Bjorks of this world, the music's going to be a really dull place. Mm. Um, you know, I, I'm not that kind of writer. I never will be. But you have to have those other artists. Um, you have to have them pushing the envelopes, pushing the barriers sideways, um, because otherwise, music will, you know. It, well, it's, it's too safe now. The radio won't play anything unless it's, you know, you know it's a certain kind of music they play, and it's, it really frustrates me. I mean, I'm sure Bjork doesn't get played on the radio very much. Mm -mm. Um, I'm sure Beck will when his new album comes out. Um, but it'll only be on, I, I know, like, a certain kind of radio station. Yeah. Oh. It's disappointing because these people are great musicians and they're saying something different. There's also, over the years, in recent years anyway, in film, your music has been use not just as a background track but as the creator of these you know pop culture moments on film like yeah. in the Moulin Rouge when they use yeah. your song yeah. or in Almost Famous the use yeah. of Tiny Dancer how did you feel when you saw those well scenes? Baz Luhrmann came all the way to England um, I've been a Baz Luhrmann fan ever since Strictly Borum um, and Romeo and Juliet and he, he came to my house in London and said would you mind if um, we used your song. I said, no, I'd be no, very flattened. He told me that he was making Moulin Rouge and Nicole was going to be at New York and he was going to be there. And when the film came out, I was touring, so I never got the chance to go and see it uh, when it first came out. And it, I probably went to see it in the cinema about three months after it came out with David in, in a, went in, in the King's Road, London, in the afternoon. And I had no idea that it played such a big part in the movie. I was astonished. Mm. And I mean, I, A, I loved the movie because, again, here's a man with a brain who's taking movies. You know, 
he does the best musical in the last 10 years and then Chicago goes and wins the Oscar there's no justice in as well um, you know but <laughs> you know the, Moulin Rouge people either loved it or they hated it I loved it because it was pushing the envelope and, mm. uh, and when I saw my song in the film I was so flattered I could not believe it um, that it played such a big part because he never told me mm. and, and I knew that Tiny Dancer was going to be a big part because Jeffrey Katzenberg is a friend of mine who worked on The Liking and runs DreamWorks um, I said oh boy he said, we've got a film coming out and you're going to really like this film because they use two of your songs because they use Mona Lisa's Mad yeah. Hatters and Tiny Dancer and he says you wait till you see Tiny Dancer and, uh, and it's very flattering when, you know, it's, not, it's nice to be you know, I'm not the hippest person to like in the world but you know I've written we've written some really great songs when Axl Rose said you know I'd give up anything just to own all the things that Elton and Bernie wrote in the first four albums yeah. Um, it's very nice of people to say that, and I know I, I know we've written some great stuff. But when when you get people out, like, you get a f affirmation later on in your career that you have written good stuff, and people are, you know are rediscovering it. It really means a lot because we started off as songwriters, yeah. and when anyone can cover your song, whether it's in a music in an elevator, or whether it's Aretha Franklin singing border song, or Ray Charles doing that's a sorry seems to be the hardest word. It's a huge compliment, and uh, I still get a kick out of that. Yeah. So seeing those things in those films. I mean, Tiny Dancer, now it's like, we weren't playing it until All Most Famous came out. Mm. And, uh, now we know we don't not play it. Yeah, it has a new life of its own. You were uh, mentioning Ray Charles. Obviously, his passing had a huge impact this year in, on the world of music. What impact did it have on you? Well, <sighs> the session that I did with Ray for Sorry seemed to be the hardest word. It was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Um, it was while we were in Los Angeles finishing off um, songs on Peach Tree Road. Mm -hmm. And I knew Ray was sick because um, word had gotten out. But I didn't know how sick he was until he came to the studio. And mm -hmm. he was very, very weak. Um, and he sat down in an armchair and I sat in the chair next to him with two mics. And he got through it in about two or three takes. And he, he was, that fire was still in his voice. And I, I, it was so emotional because he was singing it's sad, so sad, it's a sad, sad situation. And he knew he was dying, and everybody else knew he was dying. And so people were in the control room in floods of tears. Um, and I kept everything that he said to me. I got a CD of all the outtakes, the conversations we had. Um, it was ironic, really. The first thing I ever did when I came to America TV was the Andy Williams show. Mm -hmm. And it was Ray Charles and me doing a duet with, of Heaven Help Us All, a Stevie Wonder song. And here I was, like, 35 years later, and I'm yes. doing the last session that he ever did. Wow. And, and it was very, very tough. I, it depressed me for the rest of the day. It was, it was saddening, it was an uplifting, uh, but most of all it was depressing because you knew that you weren't, you know, everyone said three weeks he had to live. He actually lasted much longer than that, but uh, yeah. you know, he was in, a huge influence on me, a huge influence on the whole of American music. I mean, R&B wise, I mean, he, you know, the Atlantic recordings he did, what, altered the state of rhythm and blues music forever um, with the risks he took doing the country and western album when people thought yeah. he was crazy and doing I Can't Stop Loving You but he had the sense to realise that soul and country music are really joined at the hip yeah. so no it was tough it was a tough day and uh, I just did a the kind of tribute to Ray television thing mm -hmm. in, in Los Angeles um, and you know I, I will cherish that memory forever I, I'll never forget it sitting next to him and him singing the song with me and him holding my hand and laughing and it was pretty emotional stuff. Yeah, it just gave me chills actually. Um, and so now you will be obviously playing these shows over a couple of years. Yeah. Do you feel like right now is the beginning of another step of evolution? Do you see yourself recording something else? I don't know, who knows? The thing that's great about this business is you never know what's going to happen. Last year, uh, an old record that I made with Tom Bell came out in England called Are You Ready For Love? And it went to number yeah. one. And uh, it was one of the greatest surprises and, and a nice surprise. You don't know what's around the corner. I, was, I had a phone call from Tim Rice offering me the Lion King job and I said yes. Uh, and that changed my life. You don't know what's going to happen. I can't predict the future and I don't want to. But all I know is that I'm in the finest shape that I've ever been as far as enjoying my life, my music. And um, I'm just you know, raring to go. and. and to play this album live is, is going to be very exciting. Yeah, you, there's a song on it, My Elusive Drug, yeah. which you didn't mention putting in the set list or whatnot. But I, I, I find it very telling, because music, mm. or maybe love, yeah. whichever was your biggest addiction, I don't know, 
but was never really talked about that much in terms of... No. Well, that's my Ray Charles Nina Simone song on the album, and it's really a song about David um, and, and how you know, he wouldn't have liked me when, if he'd have met me like 15, 16 years ago, <laughs> and what I've come through in my life. And, uh, we actually are going to do a show, in, um, two shows in Atlanta, on the 4th and 5th of November, and we're using the singers, the gospel singers, and do nine songs from the new, new album, and then do 12 old songs using a full gospel choir in an old church, and we're going to tear the place down, and we, we'll be doing my losing. I can't wait to play these songs live, and uh, yeah. actually we've been rehearsing them in the afternoons here, so getting ready for it, and I, so I know what they sound like, and they sound great. And because we played them live, so they're easy to sing live. There's no complication involved. Yeah, so is that David's your song? Yeah, that's Dave, my, my David's song on the album, yeah. Do you, I've, you have such a, it seems you have such a strong connection. I remember when I saw Tantrums and, Tantrums and Tiaras, I said, that's really brave of them, to put a camera between them. Right. He was extremely bold with you in the yeah. questions he asked, in the yeah. situations he posed to you. Was that kind of a frontier you guys kind of passed over when that movie was made, in your relationship? Well, you know, I watched that and I obviously realized, you know, I just laughed at that so much, especially the bad behavior. I mean, <laughs> it was just, I, it was the only thing of mine that I've ever been able to watch and, and, and look at because it was the truth. Um, I, I can never watch a DVD of myself. Uh, what's the point? I just, like, I've seen it, I've done the thing, why watch it? I'm only going to see things that I don't like, so it's better that I don't watch it. Um, but that I could watch because it was the truth. And I learned a lot about my behavior and, and our relationship. And, you know, a lot of people, that would have wrecked their relationship. It just put us closer. Were you, while the film was being made, were there periods where you got angry at him and said, why are you doing this to me? Yeah, there's that scene in France where I tell him, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> never coming to the south of France again. Yeah. And I, you know, get, get out. We're leaving and tomorrow. I thought I bought a house in the south of France the next year. Just typical me. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's just overwhelmed. You know, you get points in your life. What I, why I wanted to do that was to show that, you know, in most documentaries and biographies you see of people, everyone says, oh, they're so great, they were so wonderful, they were wonderful. Like, you get anecdotes from people who don't want to say anything nasty, so you get yeah. you know, an hour love fest. Well, every artist who's creative, whether they're a writer, a director, uh, an author, a singer, whatever, an art, a painter, a sculptor, photographer, they all have that monster inside of them. I don't know what it is, but every single one of us does. And I wanted to show that, you know, yeah, we can be really nice people, but there are times when we act like monsters mm. because of, you know, the positions we put ourselves in, the way we drive ourselves, the, t the way we become tired, and that, you know, that we aren't all sweetness and light. And I wanted the truth to come out. Um, and, you know, people said, oh, I wouldn't have done that if I were you, but I have no regrets. I'm so proud of that program because, you know, it was, I was fed up with seeing bullshit. Do you feel like there's too much bullshit in the artistic oh. uh, music community these oh, days? Oh, there's too much bullshit in the world. I mean, it's just like, you know, I, I said this thing about Madonna last week, and uh, I know I regret saying it the way because I, she's a friend, and, and and she just happened to be, you know, it, she, it was the wrong place, the wrong time yeah. in a way. But um, I don't want to really go into that. But um, because I said it, it was like you just said, I I really support Hitler, and oh, I I hate cripples, or you know, it's like. <laughs> What? I only just said, you know, lip syncing was, you know, yeah. not a good thing. I did say they should all be shot. I suppose that was a bit over the top. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a bee in my bonnet. I think shows should be live. And I just think people, you know, it, it was an unfortunate thing that happened. And um, eventually I will make my apologies to Madonna because I think she's a really a great artist, except that she, the show wasn't entirely live, so it shouldn't have been the live show yeah. section. If it had been in the best show, I would have shut up and said nothing. But, you know, people are so afraid to keep that. I mean, we live in a culture of fear, and especially in America, where people have been you know, rush out. We have an orange alert. Um, we have an orange alert. People go out and buy duct tape and water. It's like, <laughs> sheep go out and buy duct tape and water, as if it's going to do them any good. And as if anything's going to happen anyway. It's, you know, it's such bullshit, and people are afraid. I've never known a climate in this country where people have been so afraid to speak up. Yeah. Because people um, are genuinely afraid for their careers. Absolutely, especially at this time. But I, I see a change in some artists. Um, we have no more time, right. but you're awesome. Thank you very much. You're no bullshit. Thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you very, very much, Elton. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.